good afternoon, good evening. It's good to see you all. It's been a little whirlwind since we were last <laughs> together. Um, I just got back from Mepkin Abbey uh, last evening, and it was a lovely, uh, fruitful, and intense visit with uh, some some great folks that are are discerning, um, looking at uh, creating programs uh, that. Uh, look at contemplative transformation uh, for people, and it's it's quite an interesting uh, design we're, we're developing. So thanks for giving me the space to do that, and uh, it's good to be back with all of you. Uh, welcome uh, to all who are new, new-ish. Um, if this is your first time, it's nice to have you here. So let me go ahead and call up our um, screen share for today. All right. So as always, uh, Benham Christ in it, I, I greet Christ in you and welcome you back to the Peace Chapel. We, um, the, the opening and the closing prayer come from John O'Donohue's um, to bless the space between us. Um, as some of you may know, uh, Penny and Sylvia are leading uh, a little retreat here on his work upcoming. So I thought I'd highlight some of his, uh, his beautiful uh, blessings. So let us pray. I arise today in the name of silence, womb of the word, in the name of stillness, home of belonging, in the name of solitude, the soul and the earth. I arise today blessed by all things, wings of breath, delight of eyes, wonder of whispers, intimacy of touch, eternity of soul, urgency of thought, miracle of health, clear in word, gracious in awareness, courageous in thought, generous in love. Amen. So our next reading, for those of you who have the book in hand, comes from uh, chapter 5 and spans pages 141 to 42 and continues, um, obviously, in the vein uh, that we had been discussing when I last saw you all. Many have suggested contemplative prayer is not a prayer of speaking, but a prayer of listening. Yet this does not go far enough. Contemplative prayer is a prayer of being. And this is why the practice of meditation is almost always universally associated with deep breathing. Our breath most immediately binds us to life. Contemplative prayer opens us to the fullness of life, the fullness of being. It is not something I do in addition to my daily activities, as it is a way of doing everything else that I do. Meister Eckert insists that for all who truly possess God, the work they do in the world is more genuinely God's work than their own. He says this, Now if a man truly has God within him, God is with him everywhere, in the street or among people, just as much as in church or in the desert or in a cell. If he possesses God truly and solely, such a man cannot be disturbed by anybody. Why? He has only think of God. Excuse me, he has only God, thinks only of God, and all things are for him nothing but God. Such a man bears God in all his works and everywhere, and all that man's works are wrought purely by God. For he who causes the work is more genuinely and truly the owner of the work than he who performs it. So let us pray. So our second reading today comes from um, pages 140 to 141. To see Christ in all 
is to see Christ not only in all people, but so too in all times, in all places, and in all things. As Merton observed, every moment contains a fertile seed that has the potential to give life. A regular commitment to solitary prayer and asceticism tills the soil of our hearts to better prepare us to receive the life-giving seeds of the Spirit. But tilled soil is no guarantee of a good crop. This singular seed, generously sown, may unexpectedly flourish in a field left fallow. In the same manner, prayer and asceticism cannot be reduced to a method or technique that will guarantee a desired outcome or enlightened state. As Origen summarized eloquently, one prays unceasingly who combines prayer with necessary duties and duties with prayer. Only in this way can we find it practicable to fulfill the commitment to pray always. It consists in regarding the whole of Christian existence as a single great prayer. And what we are accustomed to call prayer is only a part of it. So we close today again with uh, John O'Donoghue. May all that is unforgiven in you be released. May your fears yield their deepest tranquilities. May all that is unlived in you blossom into the future, great with love. Amen. So good morning and uh, welcome back. It's good to be with you all. And as always, I might open the floor to your um, comments or questions or insights. So we take a few moments in quiet and uh, just feel free to chime in as you feel ready. Good morning, Vincent. It's Michael. Hi there, Michael. Good morning. Good morning. You know, it made me think how often we forget Christ when things are going good and we think we're in charge of everything. And yet how quickly we turn to him as soon as anything becomes dire. Indeed. And how, yeah. How, as you said, uh, what we should strive for as living with Christ with us each day and each occurrence of whatever comes, mm -hmm. but whether it be good or bad. Right. That's right. And I think you know, one of the things that I'm, um, I'm trying to kind of spell out in, in some of the comments here, particularly about, you know, what I'm citing in terms of, um, Meister Eckert and so on, is that um, to, to a move beyond the idea of prayer merely as listening, although that is certainly a deep component. Uh, but the the phrase contemplation, more than listening, actually is more of a comes from more of the idea of gazing uh, than hearing, of um, attending to something with, with uh, kind of a gentle gaze. Um, so what does it mean to move beyond gazing, to move beyond listening to this question of real embodiment so that despite all of our ups and downs, how we grapple to kind of uh, see within that a posture, maybe is a good way to put it, a posture of prayer that goes beyond what we've normally come to think of it. Um, 
and to begin to realize, which is what this chapter is going to try to explore, what it means to embody prayer, to become prayer, um, not merely uh, the types of rituals or even meditative practices that we associate with prayer, but what it means to do what we do prayerfully. And, it, you know, what I strive for, failingly, is, is the equilibrium that that can bring um, to, to see each moment as prayer, or at least as an opportunity for that. Um, Mary, please. Mary Super, I had. Hi. Hi, good morning. Um, yeah, the contemplative prayer as a prayer of being, a way of doing everything else that I do. Um, I love that it, it reminds me of this notion that prayer really is presence. Um, it's being present, being aware. And my, you know, my experience anyway, is that if I am present, and if I am aware, then I'm almost like a walking prayer in the sense that wherever I go, I bring that with me right. and I don't have to necessarily do anything, um, but just be. And so one example um, that comes to mind for me is after COVID, I had a real challenge in terms of um, moving back into the worshiping community that I belong to. Mm -hmm. it was it was challenging there was um there was a lot of dysfunction and and what was the kind of um turning point for me was realizing that i could bring something to that community by my presence and that became part of the prayer if that makes sense mm -hmm. um if i have a presence of um, welcome, generosity, openness, that that just comes with me and, and kind of spreads um, just by being there. And the other example I think about is last night I was very, very tired and I was um, fixing dinner and I was, um, you know, and doing the dishes. And there was that part of me that was kind of irritated. And if I can keep coming back to the sense that I'm doing this out of love, you know, as opposed to getting caught in the irritation, but, but kind of flip the switch and, and sink down into that sense, then that too becomes prayer. It's kind of an ascesis as well, but it also right. becomes prayer. So I just, I really resonate with the sense that um, prayer is a way of, of being and doing everything that you do. And for me right now, that's kind of my aim, I guess. Right. Thanks, Mary. So, you know, you're really touching on some of the um, conversations that I had at Mepkin Abbey this past um, week, where we're trying to look at a program that provides tools for people to live essentially a transformed life. Um, and the relevance of you know what I'm talking about here, uh, even today, which is to say that you know you you, you that that even that we're trying to, in other words, till the soil of the soul so that it's more capable of receiving those seeds. But as I say here, tilled soil is no guarantee of a good crop, and a singular seed generously sown may unexpectedly unexpectedly flourish in a field left fallow, um, and so. You know, this idea that prayer and asasis could somehow produce a result is, is, is untenable, ultimately. There's no, because this is all about grace. It's all about opening ourselves to the movement of grace. So we were thinking this through as we were trying to develop, well, what, what does it mean to till the soil? In other words, to give grace the best chance possible in an individual to take root, to bring about transformation, and to help an individual become a transformed person. Um, sorry, I'm going to just go ahead and try to um, mute there for the bird sound in the back. Sorry. Um, so, um, so one of the things that we, you know, we explored is exactly this. For those of us who are looking to live the contemplative life in the world, it really is often about what tools, what contemplative or meditative tools might we be able to engage at any particular moment 
that helps us respond in life to a situation, an individual, a particular moment in which um, we can move away from the reactive self or the egoic self or the wounded self into a place that is more grounded and indeed prayerful or an embodiment of prayer. And that is something that was really palpable that came through throughout the week is what would it mean to help teach um, folks who say came through this program to examine on the one hand what meditative or contemplative tools are available, but then how that how they transform not just uh, the way I engage methods throughout the day, but the way I engage the day itself, the way I embody uh, my, my my place in the world. Um, so this is sort of what we're looking at, and it strikes me, Mary Sue, that what you're talking about is exactly the aim we're looking for, to really see this as, a, as not just a practice that, oh, I've done my 20 minutes and now get on with the day, but what meditative practices do I carry or do I have at my disposal when I find myself getting into a wounded place, a reactive place, an egoic place that I can sort of begin to draw from? And then what kind of community, say something like this one, can be built around that where I can say, hey, I blew it this week, here's what happened, and kind of be held and carried in that. Or, hey, I didn't blow it this week. I actually uh, found a moment of grace and transformation and we can celebrate that together. So these are the types of things we're looking for to really concretize the relationship between practice and being and how to help people facilitate that rather than just have a private practice that does its thing and then you get on with your day right so what does it mean to have the tools at our disposal to live a transformed life and to to give as much room and potential as possible for those seeds of grace to take root in me without thinking of it as a method that will guarantee anything because of course that's not possible Right. And I think, I mean, just, I know this has been like lengthy, but I think for me too, my um, participation in the, in the wisdom community and the work that I've done in there has made a huge difference. And I think that's where I see it really playing out in my life, that it, it becomes something that actually does transform that, right. that way of seeing. That's Thanks. wonderful. Of course. Thank you. Um, very soon. Um, Anna, good morning. Good morning. I'm going back to an early, earlier comment you made about um, soft gazing. Mm -hmm. It sparked in me a, a memory of when I first started learning meditation. It was in a Zen tradition, and um, I felt since I needed to empty my mind entirely that having any um, visual um, input at all would like detract me from that but I was corrected by my teacher you know who said you need to do a soft gaze and you know your eyes need to be in, a, in that tradition your eyes need to be in a certain position and um it did help and um I, I did learn it but it's it's interesting that you would bring it up um and I haven't thought of that in years about the soft gaze Right. And in the Christian tradition, the soft gaze is often associated with what we would call icon gazing. So kind of sitting and meditating before a particular image or portrait um, of Christ or the saints or Mary or some some figure that is sort of uh, bringing you into a kind of dialogue um, with with that. And as most of you probably now know, within Christian tradition, icons are seen as windows to the divine. In other words, they're not ends in themselves, but doorways or portals to what they point to, to the divine presence that lies clearly far beyond um, a piece of wood that's painted, which would become an idol um, otherwise. But the idea is that, you know, you, you, you sit in the presence that the icon is pointing to, and by gazing, by sort of holding that soft gaze, um, it kind of it evokes and cultivates that deep sense of presence of that which is otherwise un, unseen, as it were. Thanks, Anna, for bringing that connection up. Um, Carl, good morning. Um, there you uh, go. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it brings to my mind the analogy of a river flowing and a leaf 
on the surface of the water. If I see myself as the leaf, that's an aspect. But if I see myself as a molecule of the water, then I am participating in the flow. I'm not just simply on the surface sensing the flow. Mm -hmm. So if I perceive myself as being that molecule flowing in the river of divine love, then my whole reality is not striving to become that molecule. It's allowing myself the freedom to be that molecule flowing in the love that is there uh, and, and carrying us through. Uh, it's another perception. So uh, it's how I perceive who I am that's critical. Mm -hmm. Am I the leaf riding on the surface? Or am I the water molecule that is, in, in a deep sense, the flow itself? Right. And, and it makes a world of difference on how I move throughout my day as Carl, a, as a, anyway. Carl, you know, I, uh, first of all, I want to thank you. It's an absolutely beautiful um, analogy. Um, and to think of yourself as a molecule, um, it isn't only, and I think this is what you're grasping for, it isn't only in that sense that you are um, in the flow, but you are, you are the flow, right? You, so the, you, you, you live your life as the flow itself. That's, that's the movement. And on the one hand, you're, you're one of billions of molecules. So there's a, an inseparable but interrelated sense of that. And um, to your point, it isn't just a surface on which you are carried like a leaf, but you become the flow itself. And in many ways, it's a, a very beautiful analogy for what essentially my book is attempting to get at, which is in deification, we recognize we are not just in relationship to Christ, but through the grace of incarnation have been transformed into Altari Christi, as the tradition says, or other Christs. Um, and that strikes me as a very similar analogy or you know to use one from my first chapter that beautiful text in john's gospel i am the vine you are the branches and i think that you know where you see that organic continuity between the incarnate christ and we who are members of that body is as to say to see an organic continuity between the river and we who are who are the very molecules that make it up and, and just like that analogy in John's gospel, which you can't reverse, we can't, at least from an orthodox position, say that I am the vine and Christ is the branch because Christ always remains the source of our own participation in the divine, as it were. <clears throat> so to the source of the river, the font, as it were, of the river uh, can't be reversed, that, that, that the river flows out of the font and yet is one with it in those molecules. So it's a very beautiful way of thinking that through. Thank you for that image. I'll hold on to that. Thank you. Uh, Penny, please. Thank you for quoting from John O'Donohue this morning. I'm um, immersing myself uh, and getting ready for this in the Celtic tradition of, of uh, blessings. And it strikes me that so much of what we're saying is is directly related to this sense of uh, presence in every moment. Um, there wasn't a separation for these um, simple people who particularly the Hebridean communities uh, on the west coast of uh, Scotland and Ireland, 
uh, between the sacred time and the, the profane time, all time uh, was sacred. And uh, John O'Donoghue describes it as that the Celts had a wonderful sense of occasion. Um, and what he meant by that was not that it was a special time, but that all time was special. And you see that in these blessings. Every part of their day, whether it's milking the cow or tending the sheep, or weaving, a lot of these prayers are, off, are up to do with women's duties, but also mm -hmm. the um, taking the, the, the cattle onto the hill or uh, in the seafaring aspects of their lives. Every moment was a moment for praise and thanksgiving and also a, a moment for asking for protection. And what strikes me is that they, they had a very profound sense of the vulnerability of life and their gratitude right. for every single thing that they saw, that they did, that they had in their hands, even to the point of always at the beginning of the day, as you read one of those prayers, but there's a lovely prayer where uh, they're asking, the, the, pr the prayer is asking to lie down with Christ in your bed at night, inside right. the bed, not just a prayer over the bed, but Join me in the bed at night. It's, it's delightful. I mean, the right. sense of infusion uh, is entirely sacramental. I mean, every part of their day was was an aspect of, of sacrament. And I find this um, so meaningful in relation to this issue of doing chores and and working and and not just saying, oh, I've got to step away, but I've got to find a way of looking at it and experiencing it as a moment of grace. Um, what's fascinating to me is I have a Jewish friend, a Jewish rabbi friend. I'm growing a tomato plant, a very large tomato plant on my, on my porch. And it's finally one of the, the uh, tomatoes is beginning to, to turn red after all waiting and waiting. And she stopped and she said, there's a special prayer in Jewish tradition for the first fruits, that when you experience something, your first crop or your first tomato, you say a special blessing. And again, I thought, oh, this is very connected to a kind of a Jewish sense of sacramentality, that um, all these blessings for different parts of the day, different chores, different aspects of your life are all celebrated with deep thanksgiving and also uh, a call for protection. Um, the Celtic mind, uh, this lovely, what they call the encircling prayers, that when you're going on a journey or when you're facing danger, you're asking uh, a circle, basically. And, and they did it, uh, in physically did it, getting ready for people who are going to the hospital or going to, going to on a dangerous journey. People stood around you, encircled you. So there are these encircling prayers that, that speak of God's protective uh, imagery. And I, I find all of this language a way in to finding a way to, to break this idea that we have to do holy things in holy places and ordinary things in ordinary places. And, and for the Celtic mind, it's all together. It's all one. So that's why I love John O'Donoghue and hope that you will join us next week. Yeah, no, it's uh, you're you're right, Penny. This is what's I think without woodenly trying to take over what was um, what we often think of as Celtic spirituality, but to try to 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 live in the spirit that they lived is the key, I think, to to learning from that particular insular development of Christianity. Um, uh, what what benefits or what value there is in that in that constant sense of intimacy that that lying down at night prayer is one of my favorite from the Carmina Gedelica because it really speaks to that that beautiful intimacy of just you know going to sleep and having the Trinity kind of all <laughs> sleeping in the same bed it sort of has this beautiful sense of intimacy to it um, so thank you yes it's all well said <laughs> um, David please. Couple things. Uh, first, uh, from John O'Donohue, uh, I have a friend uh, who's just been diagnosed with acute leukemia, and, mm. and I was glad to to share with him uh, one of O'Donohue's blessings. Blessings 
on the arrival for a friend on the arrival of illness mm -hmm. and the beautiful way in which he, he invites us to, to ponder even that kind of an illness and see, see blessings and look for God's presence in it. So I just commend that to folks uh, from, from his book of blessings. The other is uh, in the reading today, uh, I stumble a little bit with the language about possessing God from, from Eckhart. Uh, and, but I, I understand what he's saying. And there's a one sentence I've been living with all week uh, from Martin Laird's first book on contemplation, when he says, God does not know how to be absent. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I hold that word, God does not know how to be absent over this reading here and read it, uh, read it that way. It's just my own stumbling with the language of the word, our possessing, uh, but that language of, uh, of, of presence and God, God does not know how to be absent. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a, a great point, David. And I think what Eckhart is getting to is really the flip side of the coin of, um, of this notion of God not knowing how to be absent, as Laird would say. Um, while I think it is true that God does not know how to be absent, I do think we know how to be absent from God in that sense, We know how, by which I mean unaware of the presence, not lacking presence. And I think that's probably what Eckhart is, is alluding to here, that, you know, it's about our own awareness of that abiding presence. Um, coming back to the icon gazing, many years ago, I kind of was struck with an image that, <clears throat> you know, the, the icon I've now prayed with, you know, for, gosh, since the early 90s, um, it, how when I'm not, you know, I'll spend my time in meditation and move on with my day, but then realizing that when I come back before that icon again, that the Christ presented there has been gazing the whole day, sort of awaiting my my return, and not only, of course, my physical return to that spot, but my my conscious awareness of that return. That while my gaze goes all over the place, like I'm teaching or I'm you know doing this or that, the gaze of Christ in that icon just remains ever present, ever awaiting my turning my attention back to that gaze, so that we can share and exchange that gaze again. Of course, I'm speaking here very metaphorically, but that what it really struck me one time how when I sat down again in the evening, that that icon hadn't budged, that that presence was there, that that gaze was held, even as mine was distracted and so forth. And I think that is a metaphor for what the, what Laird and Eckert are trying to get at, in a sense, two sides of the same coin. Yeah, but, but I agree with you that we definitely would not want to read Eckert in a literalist sense of possessing something that is otherwise absent. Uh, it's more awareness of something that is otherwise present. So thank you for that. <clears throat> um, Andrew, good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I appreciated hearing at the very beginning of your reading on page 141 about contemplators out of prayer, speaking of the prayer of listening. If this is not going enough, kind of prayer is a prayer of being. And this is why the practice of meditation is almost universally associated with deep breathing. Our breath will immediately binds us to life. I often need that reminder. And sometimes I try to make contemplation out to be like rocket science, make it kind of awfully complicated and have read enough books about it and buy, you know, all that. And uh, I'm just the forgetting of the basic, basic reality of deep breathing. Right. If I'm skipping that, all the books <laughs> in the world ain't going to make a bit of difference. And I'm not being simplistic. I'm not being anti-intellectual. Don't get me wrong. No, nope, I know that. The forgetting. I reminded of a story. I'm a, I discovered opera through the Saturday afternoon opera broadcast on radio over the years. And, Years ago, Bridget Nielsen was interviewed, and she was back teaching a master class in singing. And she says one of the first things she has to do with her students is to teach them what they already have known their whole lives. 
about the breathing. And she says, you notice you bring a newborn infant home, a newborn, <clears throat> and the infant has no trouble being heard throughout a three-story house. Just the deep breathing, the deep breathing. And she says she has to teach her students, teach her students to relearn that. And I think that's why I love the reminder day about the deep breathing, to remind me that that is of essence. <laughs> and uh, so I just thank you for the reminder. Thank you, Andrew. That's a great way to put it, to learn what we already know or what we've always known. Uh, and in many ways, that is, uh, I think, a metaphor for the whole of the spiritual life, to, 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 to wake up to what's already there, to... Um, to to you know to come back to the previous comment to possess or to become aware of what is abundantly available um and doesn't know how to be otherwise um the section of the of this particular chapter that you pointed out um where you know breath most immediately binds us to life and so on and and the need to put that into practice is is not at all being anti-intellectual as i would see it i think one of the greatest obstacles to prayer our books on spirituality. Uh, most of us would much rather uh, sit and read about the ecstasy of some medieval saint in prayer than to sit in the dry boredom of our own <laughs> sort of, um, you know, half-hearted, distracted uh, desolation that we call meditation. And so um, be careful about, you know, or, you know, to open up how I opened up this chapter reminded when I was back in college of a monk who said, you know, you could read all the cookbooks in the world, but until you feel the heat of the oven, you're not going to bake that loaf of bread. And I think that that is exactly what you're talking about. So it's a balance. And to be very aware that it is precisely the spiritual things, or as we name them, that can become the most seductive distractions. Because who could argue with sitting down to read a nice chapter of Contemplating Christ or or some other book by Rohr or Keating uh, that that essentially you know opens up or in, instructs us on the on the life of the uh, of the spirit, um, but in many ways those are the things that can become the most subtle of distractions. Uh, so there's a time for intellectual engagement and for framing what meditation or prayer looks like in relationship to scripture and tradition and to the liturgy and to community and to ethics and on and on. But at the end of the day, it comes down to putting that aside and being. This is, this is the, the difficult part. Um, that wonderful Buddhist saying that the most difficult part of meditation is finding the cushion, I think spans across you know, religious traditions. Yeah. So thank you for those comments. Uh, Carol, hello. Hello, hello, everybody. Um, the one uh, quote about um, praying with uh, in all our duties reminded me of uh, Brother Lawrence, who um, hated being in the kitchen, and that's what he was ordered to do to be a cook. And so he um, he just found God in all the pots and pans and all his work. And um, I had a duty, uh, this is quite a while ago, to help my dad uh, who had an accident and he was in the hospital and I was going to have to find a nursing home for him in Florida. And um, my dad and I had a really, very uh, difficult relationship. So this was really, really hard for me. And uh, lo and behold, I had the book of Brother Lawrence uh, that I was reading on the flight down to uh, Florida. And I thought, okay, God, I'm going to give this all to you. I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, you're just, I'm going to give this whole thing to you. And it was like a miracle for me <laughs> that it, it just all went smoothly. And I was not flustered or angry. And, um, and so it, it, a chore became a blessing for me. It wasn't a blessing for him, obviously, but it was a blessing for me and that I could do it without anger, resentment, and all of that. 
So it really was grace. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful, Carol. And that's exactly it. You know, it's sometimes when we give ourselves over to these practices that that carry us really into the fullness of, of living, we start to see they're not just separate strands of things we do, but things we embody, right? And, and ways to embody that awareness. And then, as you point out, it, it can be surprisingly a graced moment. Yeah, uh, that really then just uh, reiterates or reaffirms the, the if you want to say, the, um, the gift of, of what it means to try to live in this contemplative way. Because so many of those seeds, as Merton points out at the beginning of his book, New Seeds of Contemplation, those seeds are endless and abundant, but a lot of them just go ungerminated because we're not prepared to receive them yet. So this is about preparing ourselves to, to see those moments of grace. And then when they happen, it's like, wow, that's surprising and yet beautiful. And there it is. That's grace. Yeah, well, and I think these moments are are everywhere if we just see them to take them. I mean, right. I don't like to cook, especially anymore after so many years of cooking. And but if I could see the vegetables and and the food there and be grateful for it and imagine where it came from and it, it would make it a pleasure. So. I well, think that's we have right. these opportunities. Yeah, and and so often the the issue is that because of a narrative we're telling ourselves, like I hate cooking, or this I don't want to stand on this long line, or I'm irritated that I'm stuck in traffic, or whatever that may be, it's the narrative that creates the perception of my separation from God. Yeah. But if in that moment of cutting carrots and washing pots and pans you're simply immersing yourself in that awareness that God is as much here mm -hmm. as if I were meditating or as if I were doing anything that I happen to enjoy. The task becomes secondary and what becomes primary is the immediacy of being present to that moment in that cultivated awareness that God is here now. And, and then the task becomes almost irrelevant to, to that deeper reality that you're bringing yourself back to. It becomes beautiful. Yeah, it, absolutely. That's right. Thank you, Carol. Well said. Um, Carol, again. <laughs> Another Carol. Um, okay, I actually have a question. But before that, you know, I usually slam the evangelical past in my life. But this was one of the things that they actually didn't teach me that I learned a lot from because not only are is the narrative that we're separate from God, we also play those tapes, you know, in our head that God doesn't love me. God gives everybody else experiences, but not me. You know, I'm not living up to the Christian life, whatever. And they instructed us to like with Christ in the bed, take Christ with you in your. So I used to drive, with, you know, imagining Jesus in the passenger seat and go into the CVS with Jesus, you know, and when my tapes wanted to play something negative, I couldn't, I couldn't do it because I knew that Jesus was there hearing it and I knew it wasn't true. It'd be like if I said it, you know what I mean? So that when you right. try to say, it, it was great because it showed me all the negative tapes that I knew were not valid and that I'd been playing in my head, but I knew if Christ was right there and I, and, you know, but anyway, my question, that wasn't my point. My question was all this breathing stuff. I love the breathing thing. And, and I, since you teach the Bible and say that some of the things never happened and the words are different and all this kind of stuff, I want to know what was going on when God breathed into us as dust and when then Jesus breathed into the spirit into us after the 40 days or was it the beginning of the 40 days with the apostles. Because I, mean, I think that's so miraculous and there's something so beautiful about that. But what is that? Yeah, well, there because those texts are so you know distant from one another, and yet part of the same kind of perceptual or theological reservoir. Insofar as you know, Judaism really is the mother faith to Christianity, which has borrowed many of those concepts and gave given them new meaning in light of the incarnation. So there's certainly distinctiveness 
there, but also a way in which Christianity wants to, us to see a continuity in that sense of the breath uh, to breathe. And as, as I'm sure most of you know, both in Hebrew and, and in Greek, as in English, breathing, um, spirating, uh, it has very close associations with the spirit. Um, in fact, the opening lines of Genesis, there's <coughs> various interpretations, whether the, um, the spirit of God hovered over the water, right? What does that spirit look like? The breath of God hovering over the water. Um, but certainly I think there is just a near universal intuition, not only in Judaism and Christianity, but across world religions that, as I said in this particular paragraph, it is the breath that most immediately uh, ties us to life. You know, you can go several days without water, uh, probably a few more days without food, but literally minutes without breathing um, before, you know, you just can't survive that. So um, that that recognition of the breath being so deeply and unalterably associated with the spirit that is life, I think, is what you're seeing in both of these. So uh, for Jesus to breathe on his apostles and say, I give you peace, my peace, I leave you, is as much to give them not just breath, but spirit right that is that is the very peace of christ um it's one of the there's a beautiful tradition within um islam where you know whenever the name of the prophet is mentioned there's a kind of invocation peace be upon him in christianity that would never quite work because the idea is that christ is the source of peace not someone upon whom we bid peace or or wish peace but is the very peace of God incarnate, right? So there's a, you see a distinctive difference there between incarnation, right? The, and, and just say, if you want to say a merely a prophetic figure on, on whom we can bid peace. So, um, uh, so that's, that's what I would say is there, you know, that it's just that deep into intuitive sense, that breath and life, even, you know, not just linguistically or uh, etymologically, but in fact, are so deeply uh, woven, so inseparable as to be summoned in both of those instances as, as really what gets to the heart of the matter. And I've always come to think of, whether this is orthodox or not, I'm not even sure, that the spirit is to the soul what the soul is to the body. In other words, the spirit is the, is the soul of the soul. It is the, that core, of that spark of divinity at the very, very core of our being. Um, and so when, you know, when, when you're reading, you know, my spirit exalts and my, my soul praises, you see, well, what's the difference? Well, um, my sense is that the spirit is that deepest uh, identity that is that breath, that life, that spirit, that, divi that divinity that animates us from the, the, the soul of the soul itself, the core of the, of the soul, that deepest place that is often and synonymously often simply called the heart right in in biblical language the heart is the very center and core of one's being um synonymous with the spirit i think okay thank you carol uh jason please okay i'm gonna type oh i'll just send my question real quick okay um as far as for contemplative prayer i have a lot of memories come up in sending prayer it feels like i'm watching a movie is that normal did all these memories come up during prayer yeah, uh, it is absolutely normal. Um, I think everyone on this uh, <laughs> Zoom call <clears throat> can attest that. Yes. Yeah, so <clears throat> here's what I would just say in a general sense. If what's coming up are simply random memories, even if they happen to be emotionally laden, you know, uh, memories of things that were hurtful or joyful or difficult or tr transitory, etc., that that this is perfectly normal and you your the goal would be to simply release them just let them go uh just like when you sleep at night random things can come up and create dreams that seem to have no particular connection or meaning uh, some of it is indeed processing others is probably just the brain entertaining itself what we think of as brain junk maybe but in a sense um what i would say jason as you should pay attention to is if there is a persistent memory that keeps coming up or a persistent 
thought that keeps arising, not just a, a series or collection of thoughts. If there's something that really feels that it needs to be looked at by its persistence, I would say attend to that. You don't need to necessarily attend to it during the time of your meditation where you can just try to gently put it aside each time it surfaces. But if you are um, having that kind of persistence, I would say outside of the meditation, that's something you'll want to have a look at. Why does this memory keep coming up whenever I'm in silence and solitude? What's, what is the unfinished business that I'm being called to look at here? Sort of like the difference between having random dreams every night and having a persistent reoccurring dream. That's your subconscious trying to tell you there's some business you need to work out. So that would be the only thing I would ask you to, to maybe be attentive to. If it's random, totally normal. Just see each one of those uh, memories as they come up as an invitation to put it aside and turn back to that loving gaze. And you'll probably have to do that 3,000 times a minute. It's perfectly normal. Um, and, then, and then what will happen is over time, if you start to notice a particular idea or memory that's persistent, that's where you want to you know, look at that elsewhere. elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's like, <clears throat> excuse me. So it's like the imagine, imaginal realm during centering prayer, huh? We go into the imaginal realm, like since you go, Rajol says, kind of. Uh, I'm sorry, could you just repeat that? You were breaking up just a little bit. It's like the imaginal realm, like Cynthia Brigeau talks about. During centering prayer, our mind's eye wanders like that, the imagination. Yes, that's exactly like right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's a, what, a funny line somewhere in Merton's writings, I think it's in his collected um, notes on the inner life where he says, um, every time he meditates, a burlesque show starts up in his mind. And <laughs> I thought that that was so funny for a monk to kind of talk about that. But so whatever, whatever it is that's sort of distracting you or that's pulling you, that is indeed the imaginal space. And some people do want to look at those uh, things because, you know, the imagination speaks a certain symbolic language and can be very informative and so on. But again, I would just say in the time that you set aside for that quiet solitude, that's that gazing, you want to continue to maintain that prayer of attention um, and intention in that sense of just coming back to the gaze. And you could always look later at, at these the imaginal realm or persistent thoughts or memories and so on. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. Um, thank you, Jason. Any other, um, any other thoughts? If not, I'll, I'll move us to a discussion about the, um, the invitation to practice. And then uh, we can discuss if anybody took me up on the practice for the last couple weeks. All right, let me go ahead and do that screen share then. So for our practice, here's the suggestion. Um, oh my gosh, you know what I realized? I forgot to create one for this week. Sorry. <laughs> I just realized I didn't do it. My bad. So, um, so okay, let's then take a moment to look at the uh, the practice from our last time, which I can't believe was was the 20th of August. My gosh, it's been a while. So um, the, the, the invitation then was to cultivate a simple practice of living ritually or what I call ceremonial, ceremonially. What embodied actions might help bring you to a place of heartfulness, deeper prayer, greater intimacy with God? What's interesting about this invitation is it really became a central piece to what we were trying to discover at MEPC. How can we provide these tools for an embodied practice throughout the week when they're needed in a given moment? So not just what do I do with distractions, but how do I love that person who's my coworker and I find really difficult or irritating or toxic? What contemplative sort of tools, if you want to say, meditative tools are in, are in my tool belt that I can draw upon in a given moment to stay grounded and centered uh, and so on. Um, so that's essentially uh, what this is asking. What embodied actions might help bring to a place of heartfulness, deeper prayer, greater intimacy with God? And wondering who, if there are takers, and I see Anna, go right ahead. So um, I discovered along the journey that um, it's possible to hold a kind of a, a place of meditation as you go throughout your daily life. And maybe it's what 
Penny was referring to about people, you know, when they're milking the cows and everything else, that I felt a place kind of in my head, I could kind of revisit where I was in meditation, the feeling in my body, kind of a stance of where the energy flow, if I can call it that in my body was and get that feeling back and then walk through my life and then pause, um, you know, during the day and see whether I was still there or not. And it, it's wonderfully calming to have that embodiment of it, it's almost like posture, but I'm not like sitting or something. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like a posture to the world, like your posture, how you present in the world is what you mean by that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And thanks for that. That's right. And, um, you know, I know even, you know, full disclosure from recent experience in which I've been struggling with a, a pretty toxic situation, not at, not at St. Columbus here, but, but outside of this community. And, um, you know, recently just found this almost visceral reaction to some of the things that had sort of begun to unfold. And by visceral, I mean physical, where um, I just, in one given moment, completely broke out into a, like a cold sweat. And my Anna actually was with me uh, at the moment when this sort of happened. And my I had to go change my t-shirt. It was like that feeling you have after you have a, when a flu breaks and, and you're sopping wet. That happened in a matter of seconds. It was shocking to me that that could actually happen. And I, I actually felt like, you know, I was going to sort of pass out and, and throw up. It was terrible sort of response to this tremendous toxicity that, um, you know, some of us here have been grappling with outside of, of St. Columbus and um, just really needing to process what that was about and why I, I've never had that kind of overwhelming sense of um, something needing to sort of come out. Um, so it's I'm still struggling to how to kind of regain equilibrium in light of, of that and how to try to remain centered because I'm realizing how much that's touching upon really old wounds and things like that, which is, you know, triggering. So, so I, I want, I say that to let you know that th this, th the posture as Anna, you've called it is, is certainly the ideal and the goal. And that at times, um, you can really be thrown from that. And, and the, 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 what, uh, what one of the folks I was talking to at the monastery this week shared with me in a private conversation is that those old wounds that get triggered also um, open the space for what he called the trickster God to bring you back to that place. And that's an invitation of divine grace to re-enter that wound and to uh, see what needs to still be addressed and what grace needs to be open to that so that you can, you know, again, find that place of love and compassion and equilibrium so that in many ways, these terrible experiences we might have where we get triggered or pushed or old wounds get opened up or old traumas um, can become a place where the trickster God actually meets us in that wound and provides that very opportunity uh, to to then look at that and see how that can be transformed into something else. Very deep work, uh, no doubt, but I just want to invite you all to be compassionate with yourselves as I've tr been trying to be with myself as I'm as I'm trying to see the great that sort of the dark grace in in what has been a rather difficult time. So this is very important, I think, for us to always bear in mind the goal, if you want to call it the goal, the, the aim, the telos, that, that fulfillment of the contemplative life, and to love ourselves. It's one of the things I loved about uh, the O'Donohue poem that, that we read this morning, um, may all that is unforgiven in you be released. Um, and I think a lot of that lack of forgiveness comes from our own inability to forgive ourselves uh, and, and how, uh, how we're being invited to, to re- re-examine that right to relive that so thanks anna for that i, I love the the term posture there because that's exactly what it is um kathy good morning good morning thank you so much uh, anna and father vincent for that very powerful share mm. um de definitely going to um listen to this again it feels very important um I sat with your homework for a couple of days and then felt an invitation to a much more, um, much smaller practice, but it, it felt important to me. And I felt drawn, I'm reading um, Malcolm Geet's book, Lifting the Veil. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, I am too. <laughs> oh, I love it's it. Great. I love yeah. it. Um, but, but he has he, one of the images that he talks about early on in the book is the the Eisenheim altarpiece. And so, um, and I'll see if I can. It's a very dark image, but I'll put it up here in case you. Let might me to hold that, through. Kathy. Hold that. I'm going to try to spotlight you for a minute to get that up there for everyone. There we go. Everyone can see that up close now. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Uh, and I can put the link to the Wikipedia uh, image of this in the chat. Um, but I was drawn to um, what, what I was moved to do is to actually hold my arms out like Christ does in that image with the same posture of the hand so that it's up lifted and and what Geet writes uh, about that posture he says that um, um, the crushing weight of pain and sorrow that bears down on all of fallen humanity seems to be the very force that wretches his meaning Christ's head downward as it mm -hmm. looks towards the earth and yet his outstretched arms and upright up raised hands, even as the fingers writhe in pain, seem to lift the whole earth back up to God in prayer. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of my centering prayer time, I usually say the Lord's Prayer. And so what I felt invited to do then is to outstretch my arms in the same way that Christ does in this image with the fingers in the, those that posture, as I said the prayer. And just the I felt more of an incarnational sense with Christ and more of, and, and just the, the prayer resonated more strongly. And one thing that then dawned on me later in, in the week as I practiced this is that it, it opened up my heart space, which usually is so shackled with concrete rebar, you name it, it's there. But this posture opens up the whole um, of my being uh, to, to grow, allow a greater space of for God's presence. It's be beautiful, Kathy. That's exactly, I think, such a beautiful example of the combination of a kind of what we would think of as a meditative or contemplative practice and then embodying that, um, not just leaving it in, in the moment uh, of the prayer itself, but a way to embody that in such a beautiful sense. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm always so delighted at, at the way you sort of find ways to integrate these, these sort of ac exercises because it's in a way, as I, as I mentioned earlier, it is precisely the, 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 the linchpin of what we were trying to discuss this week. What, what is the difference between a program that simply teaches you how to meditate and one that teaches you how to live contemplatively? And this is essentially what these practices are intended to help us do, to kind of take the theory and the theology and the concept and the practices and then bring them into a lived experience, right, as tools for, for opening to that grace. So thank you for that beautiful and shining example. <laughs> Appreciate that. Were there any other um, uh, questions or thoughts or sharing? What's the icon you use? Oh, um, I, I can I can get it for you. Hold on. <clears throat> Let me try to I'll try to just spotlight myself a minute again to make this a little uh, easier. Let me see. OK. So um, this is a, a triptych. And all, it's probably hard for you to see, but all on the sides are all different images from the life of Christ. In all the four corners are the prophets that, you know, sort of uh, are seen to have prophesied Christ. And at the very center of his heart is the Rublev's Trinity. So it almost becomes an infinity on itself. So you see Christ within his own heart there, that sort of perichoretic relationship. Um, and this, this is actually um, a Russian icon. It's called Jesus, Lover of Humankind. And um, it was the original is made for the Hermits of Bethlehem, which are in Morristown, New Jersey. 
and they live more than they, it's a male female community they live in hermitages rather than in a monastic enclosure so they all live in their own little hermitage and then there's a center uh, church and the original one of this is gigantic it's probably uh goodness four feet high and maybe three feet wide and then plus you have those triptych parts it's it, it's absolutely stunning um so that that's and i i went on an extended retreat there pursuing that question of whether i would join them many many years ago back in my 20s and and it was there that i purchased this i think it was actually 19 1990 and uh purchased it there and then decided um to, to that it would really just it just resonated with me ever since so that was um did I hear you correctly that uh, it was painted there, even though it's Russian, it originated there and it's contemporary? Uh, it, was, it was commissioned by the hermits there by by the icon writer whose name I can give you. Um, but, was it a Russian icon, iconographer? Yeah, right. So that's correct. So the, the, is he in America or in Russia? You know what? I don't know. Uh, let me see. Um, it doesn't say I think he's he's an American Russian uh-huh yeah Thank you. right and uh, contemporary yes yes Thank oh absolutely you. this was probably paint the original was probably painted in the 80s I'm gonna guess okay thank you thank you okay um <clears throat> so <clears throat> thank you all for uh a lovely uh, time back. I believe we're on again. Uh, you, I think for those of you who don't know, I did send out um, uh, the, the Saturdays I'm not available through the end of the year, uh, just so that you had those in advance and could plan accordingly. I'll ask Joanne came to send those out again. Uh, I'll have her probably wait until the Saturday before my next hiatus so that you all have it fresh. And for those who are new to the list, we'll get it then. Otherwise, you can expect me to be here then. All right on Saturday. So thank you all um, <clears throat> for being with me today and, and for this time together. And so I pray that you go in the peace of Christ. I pray that you continue to be open to that gaze of a presence who knows not how to be un unavailable and that you open your heart to that same availability of the divine in all that you do. And so I pray you go with my blessing in the name of the three and one and one and three. Amen.